Today, when men in the public spotlight are asked to express their opinion on the myriad of government proposals and projects, all too often their answers seem to be based not upon any solid principle, but upon the popularity of the specific government program in question. Any program that appears to be popular will seldom be opposed by them. This seems especially true if they are already in or seeking to gain some public office. When men must make decisions on vital political questions of the day, these decisions should be based upon and measured against certain basic principles regarding the proper role of government. The American concept is that our government was instituted of God for the benefit of man, and that God holds men accountable for their acts in relation to it. This concept declares that no government can exist in peace except such laws are framed and held inviolate, as will secure to each individual the protection of life, the right to own and control property, the free exercise of conscience, and that all men, while protected in their inherent and unalienable rights by the laws of such government, are bound to sustain and uphold the respective government in which they reside. This concept holds that sedition and rebellion are unbecoming every citizen thus protected and should be punished accordingly. At the same time, however, holding sacred the freedom of conscience and the right to properly dissent. Securing and protecting the rights, liberty, and freedoms of every individual is generally agreed to be the basic and most important single function of any government. But what are those rights, and what is their source? Until these questions are answered, there is little likelihood that we can correctly determine how government can best secure them. Let us first consider the origin of man's freedoms and rights. Man's rights are either God-given as part of the divine plan, or they are granted by government as part of the political plan. God or government, these are the only two possible sources. Thomas Paine, author, statesman, and one of the greatest patriots in the days of the American Revolution, stated unequivocally, rights are not gifts from one man to another, nor from one class of men to another. It is impossible to discover any origin of rights otherwise than in the origin of man. In this magnificent treatise on freedom, Frederick Bastia pointed out life, liberty, and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. Reason, tradition, and religious convictions all lead us to accept the divine origin of man's rights. For if we reject this and accept the premise that human rights are granted by government, then we must be willing to accept the corollary that they can be denied by government. The First Amendment of the Constitution sets forth the doctrine of separation of church and state. As traditionally interpreted to prohibit the establishment of an official national religion, this has proven to be both wise and beneficial. But current interpretations, which divorce government from any formal recognition of God, is a trend that strikes a potentially fatal blow at the concept of the divine origin of man's rights and unlocks the door for an easy entry of future tyranny. The struggles and sacrifices of early generations enable Americans to enjoy the blessings of freedom today. This proud inheritance will have been forsaken if Americans should ever come to accept that their rights and freedoms are instituted among men by politicians and bureaucrats. The framers of our Declaration of Independence knew well the lessons of history. The noble document they drafted still stands as a monument to their wisdom, and each of us should re-examine and keep in mind the inspired words they set forth. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. 
Since God created man with certain unalienable rights, and man in turn created government to help secure and safeguard those rights, it follows that man is superior to government and should remain master over it. A government is nothing more or less than a group of citizens who have been hired to perform certain functions and discharge certain responsibilities. Government itself has no innate power or privilege to do anything, for its only source of authority and power is from the people who have created it. We, the people, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. These words from the preamble to the Constitution of the United States show this firm foundation on which our government was founded. It is equally important to keep in mind that the people who create a government can give to that government only such powers as they themselves have in the first place. Obviously, they cannot give that which they do not possess. So the question simply stated is, what powers properly belong to each and every person in the absence of and prior to the establishment of any organized governmental farm? The answer to this question is vital to an understanding of the principles which underlie the proper functions of government. There is no doubt that each man is justified in using force if necessary to defend himself against physical harm, against theft of the fruits of his labor, and against his enslavement by another. Indeed, the early pioneers found that a great deal of their time and energy was being spent in defending themselves, their property, and their liberty. But in order for man to prosper, he cannot afford to spend his time constantly guarding his family and his property against attack and theft. So he joins together with his neighbors and hires a sheriff. At this precise moment, government is born. The individual citizens delegate to the sheriff their unquestionable right to protect themselves. The sheriff does for them only what they had a right to do for themselves, nothing more. Now let us go a step further in the question of man's right to delegate power. Suppose Pioneer A has one horse. He also wants another horse, but does not have the money or other means to buy one. Pioneer B has three horses, and Pioneer A decides that he would like to share in his neighbor's good fortune. Is he entitled to take one of his neighbor's horses? Obviously not. If his neighbor wishes to give it or to lend it, that is another question. But so long as Pioneer B wishes to keep his property, A has no just claim to it. If A has no proper power to take B's property, he obviously cannot delegate any such power to the sheriff. Even if everyone in the community desires that B give his extra horse to A, they have no right individually or collectively to force him to do so. They cannot delegate a power they themselves do not have. No government can justly claim the power to seize and redistribute the people's wealth and property or to force reluctant citizens to perform acts of charity against their will. Government is created by man, and no man possesses any such power to delegate to government. Therefore, the proper role of the various levels of government includes such defensive activities as maintaining the national military and local police forces for protection against loss of life, loss of property, and loss of liberty, at the hands of either foreign despots or domestic criminals. It also includes those powers necessarily incidental to the protective function, such as the maintenance of courts, where those charged with crimes may be tried and where disputes between citizens may be impartially settled. The establishment of a monetary system and a standard of weights and measures so that courts may render monetary judgments. Taxing authorities may levy taxes, and citizens may have a uniform standard to use in their business dealings. Before people lend their support to any government program or project, they should examine it carefully. Those who give their support to questionable government programs are acting very short-sightedly. They ignore history and fail to recognize that government is no plaything. As George Washington warned, government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. 
Copies of the Constitution are widely available. This is a standard that each of us can refer to and use in determining whether a law is good or bad. This inspired document is a solemn agreement between the citizens of this nation which every officer of government is under a sacred duty to obey. Our Constitution wisely limits the functions of the federal government, leaving the great bulk of legitimate activities of government to be carried out at the state or local level. It is a firm and sound principle that the smallest or lowest level of government that can possibly undertake the task is the one that should do so. First, the city or community. If they cannot handle the problem, then the county level of government should be considered. If the county level is unable to deal successfully with the problem, then next the state. And only if no smaller unit can possibly do the job should the federal government be considered. This is merely the application to the field of politics of that wise and time-tested principle of never asking a larger group to do that which can be done by a smaller group. Thomas Jefferson understood this principle very well and cautioned, let the national government be entrusted with the defense of the nation and its foreign and federal relations. The state governments, with the civil rights, law, police, and administration of what concerns the state generally. The counties, with the local concerns of the counties. And each ward direct the interests within itself. This great American patriot went on to answer a question that seems to have confused man throughout history. What has destroyed liberty and the rights of man in every government which has ever existed under the sun? The generalizing and concentrating of cares and powers into one body. It is well to remember that it was the 13 separate and sovereign states of this republic that created the federal government and delegated certain limited powers to it. The federal government did not create the states. Welfare programs, schemes for distribution of the wealth, and other programs which coerce people into acting in accordance with a prescribed code of social planning, are government activities which today pose a grave danger to the individual American's continued freedom. A simple test can be applied to every government program. Do I, as an individual, have a right to use force upon my neighbor to accomplish a particular goal? If I do have such a right, then I may delegate that power to my government to exercise on my behalf. But if I do not have that right as an individual, then I cannot delegate it to any level of government. To be sure, there are times when this principle of the proper role of government is most annoying and inconvenient. But the uh, creature will exceed its creator and become the master if government is permitted to manufacture its own authority out of thin air and to create self-proclaimed powers not delegated to it by the people. Once government seizes the aggressive role of redistributing the wealth and providing so-called benefits for some of its citizens, it then becomes a means for what is accurately described as legalized plunder. Legal plunder is defined by Bastiat as, quote, when a portion of wealth is transferred from the person who owns it without his consent and without compensation, and whether by force or by fraud to anyone who does not own it, then I say that property is violated, that an act of plunder is committed, unquote. Once legal plunder begins occurring, History proves that each class or special interest group competes with the others to grasp and throw the lever of governmental power in their favor, or at least to immunize itself against the effects of a previous thrust. Labor gets a minimum wage. Agriculture receives a price support. Consumers insist on price controls. And industry gets protective tariffs. In the end, none of them are much further ahead but all of them lose some of their personal freedom. The welfare state, and finally totalitarianism, has always been the end result when the principle of the protective function of government gives way to the aggressive or distributive function. This is a vitally important but seldom heeded lesson that history offers. It is people, people who work and produce, that create wealth.
All historians know that no government in the history of mankind has ever created any wealth. According to Karl Marx, a human being is primarily an economic creature. In other words, man's material well-being is all-important. His privacy and his freedom are strictly secondary. The Soviet Constitution reflects this materialistic philosophy by placing its emphasis on material security. Housing, food, clothing, medical care. These are the same things that might be provided in a prison. The basic concept is that the government has full responsibility for the welfare of the people. But in order to discharge that responsibility, it must assume absolute control of all their activities. It is significant that in actuality, the Russian people have few of the rights supposedly guaranteed to them in their constitution, while the American people have them in abundance, even though they are not guaranteed by our government. The reason is obvious. Unless the people bake one loaf of bread for each citizen, there will not be a loaf of bread for each citizen to eat. Constitutions can be written, laws can be passed, and imperial decrees can be issued. But unless the bread is produced, it can never be distributed. The American philosophy of limited government and individual responsibility has enabled us to achieve an abundance undreamed of in ancient times and the principle behind it can be reduced to a rather simple formula. Widespread abundance must be achieved before economic security for all is even possible. Industrious and efficient production are necessary to create this abundance. Labor that is energetic, willing and eager makes such production possible. Such labor can be obtained only with incentive. Of all forms of incentive, the freedom to attain a reward for one's labors is the most sustaining for most people. Sometimes called the profit motive, it is simply the right to plan and to earn and to enjoy the fruits of your labor. This profit motive diminishes as government controls, regulations and taxes increase to deny the fruits of success to those who produce. Therefore, government intervention to redistribute the material rewards of labor results in the eventual destruction of the productive base of society. When this base is destroyed, real abundance and security for more than the ruling elite is quite impossible. This brings up the question of how is it possible to cut out the various welfare state features of our government? Drastic surgery is necessary. And like all surgery, it will not be without some discomfort for a long time to come. But it must be done if the patient is to be saved. Everyone wants to avoid the tremendous economic and social upheaval that would be caused if all the welfare state programs currently in force were dropped simultaneously. So the first step toward restoring the concept of limited government should be to freeze all welfare state programs at their present level. The next step would be to allow all present programs to run out their term with absolutely no renewal and the gradual phasing out of those programs which are indefinite in their term. What about the lame, the sick, and the destitute is an often voiced question. Most other countries in the world have attempted to use the power of government to meet this need. Yet in every case, the improvement has been marginal at best. By comparison, America traditionally has followed Jefferson's advice of relying on individual action and charity. The result is that the United States has fewer cases of genuine hardship per capita than any other country in the entire world or throughout all history. Even during the depths of the Depression of the 1930s, Americans ate and lived better than most people in other countries do even today. The advocates of outright socialism find little acceptance today, but many people seem to be taken in by the argument that just a little bit of socialism is good, so long as it does not go too far. History proves that once begun, the socialist welfare state is difficult to check before it comes to its full flower of dictatorship. But let us hope that this time around the trend can be reversed. Three factors may make a difference. First, there is sufficient historical knowledge of the failures of socialism 
and of the past mistakes of previous civilizations. Secondly, there are modern means of rapid and effective communications to transmit these lessons of history to a large, literate population. Thirdly, there is a growing number of dedicated men and women who at great personal sacrifice are actively working to promote a wider understanding and appreciation of the American concept. The timely joining together of these three factors may make it possible for the trend to be reversed. Freedom is fragile. It must be preserved if it is to be passed on to future generations. Every American who values his freedom should become alert for signs of danger. An alarming number of Americans are busily enjoying their freedom but are indifferent and apathetic to the erosion of freedom. Their apathy is allowing America to be drawn toward the dictatorial federalism. The breakdown of law and order is occurring and increasing because the exercising of political expediency is crippling law enforcement agencies. Under the threat of pressure groups and constant propagandizement for change, America is condoning the behavior of a godless society. The question is, can Americans face up to and cope with such realities? The answer is in our hands. There is much work to be done. The time is short. Let us begin in earnest now. And may God bless our efforts.